Namaste and welcome back to Blue Cypress School of Holism. My name is Namjoti Kaur Khalsa and today we are in the backyard gardens. This is a backyard medicinal and apothecary garden. So we're gonna do a quick tour of what's going on back here. And this year, for those of you who have visited the school before, you know that it's been pretty wild back here in the past, but I've been really intentional about grouping plants together and doing a lot more cultivation uh, this season. And so it looks a lot different back here. So thank you for joining me and let's begin. So here we are with the Vitex tree and this Vitex tree is about four years old. And um, last fall, I cut it way down to the ground. So all of this that you see is new growth that started this spring. So if you come in a little bit closer, you can see here that it's no longer flowering. It has these beautiful purple flowers and now it's going to seed. And these berries, the Vitex berries, are the part that we use to make medicine. So I love this Vitex tree. Vitex is a really great ally, especially for women. And um, it's an important herb for us, um, balancing hormones and supporting us as we move through things like PMS and mood swings um, and even into the menopausal years. So Vitex is really an ally for women and I'm really happy that it's doing so well here. You see Vitex a lot throughout the Texas Hill Country as a landscape tree. And um, I think that's wonderful because you can look around and see yourself surrounded by medicine. Over here, I just transplanted some little tiny, tiny loquat trees. Over the spring, we visited with a friend and we harvested a bunch of loquat fruit. And I came and threw the seeds into the backyard and they just started to really take root. So here's one of the little baby loquats and another one here. Over here we have these black elephant ears. And I was at our local feed store when I saw these and I just really fell in love with them. And um, I love that they're dark. They're really like a purplish black color and they're doing really well back here in this circle of oak trees. Here we have some baby datura, really soft, precious baby datura. <clears throat> and as we come around here, this area here is kind of a graveyard altar space, which is one of the main reasons why the datura is here, the moonflower. And this one you can see she's really leggy and there's some new growth coming because I was having some issues with some kind of bug that was coming in and eating the leaves. So if you all have ever grown Datura before and you're familiar with what comes in and kind of attacks it, then please leave some comments down below because I've had a really hard time with this specific Datura and also with the Belladonna and they're both nightshades. So I figure it's got to be some kind of nightshade pest. Um, I recently, just the other day, cut off all of the dead leaves. I was, I couldn't bring myself to cut it all the way down to the ground because I love this plant so much. So I cut off all of the, the dead leaves and sprayed everything with some neem spray. And that seems to have done the trick for now, but I'm really open to any advice that you all may have about how to deter any pests that are coming around the nightshade plants. Here we have Black Eyed Susan that's been blooming for a long time and it kind of gets knocked over and <laughs> it's um, looking kind of rough right now, but I think it's kind of reaching the end of its season. Here interspersed are calendula babies. I have planted calendula all over the whole yard because it's such a wonderful flower to have around, such a wonderful herb for us to use. Here is some passion vine that's coming and climbing this trellis. And there are actually two flowers that came in to bloom this morning. I've been waiting for these two flowers to bloom for days now. <clears throat> you can actually come around here and you'll get a better view if you want to really try to catch those flowers. Here, I'll turn them to the camera. Let's see. Passion flowers are such magical. Um, otherworldly flowers. 
I love to see them bloom and I end up just coming out and you can just pop them off. I like that they have this little, I call it the belly button. <laughs> it's like this little navel on the back of the passion flower. And my favorite way to uh, consume the passion flower is just to turn the flower around and put the whole thing in my mouth and just eat it. So here we go. It's like one of those cooking shows where they're like, oh, it's so good, it's wonderful. So if you have passion flowers, I highly recommend eating them. That's hard to do on camera <laughs> to eat a passion flower. Okay, here we have burdock and there's a lot of experimentation that's happening back here in this garden because there are a lot of things that people will tell you you can't grow in certain areas and while that may be true to a certain extent i prefer to find out on my own so the burdock was an experiment i planted it from seed and i haven't had any problems i think it's doing really well this leaf is looking a little bit rough but for the most part it's done really well and what i love about burdock is that you can harvest the root during its first year. So I planted this in the spring and in the fall, we'll be able to go in and harvest the root and use it in our winter broths and stews and things like that to add some nourishment and some medicine to our winter season here at home. Over here at the base of the trellis, I've planted some gourds and there's lupa gourds and birdhouse gourds and bushel gourds that I've planted around all of the trellises. So I don't really know which one that is, but we'll see. And there's more. All of these are some sort of gourd. Back here behind this trellis is the lady's mantle. And the lady's mantle was looking a lot healthier earlier in the spring than it does right now, probably just because it's so hot right now in the Texas Hill Country. I think all this week will be in the 90s and then a couple of days will be beyond 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I think that's what's causing the ladies mantle to suffer just a little bit. But this was another herb that I wasn't sure if I would be able to grow here. And it's here at the base of these big old oak trees. And this area of the garden doesn't get that much direct sun. It doesn't get any direct sun. It's more partial sun and shade. And so I think that's why the ladies mantle has been doing all right over here. The plant behind the ladies mantle is called Coral Bells and a nickname for it is Lucid Dreams. And a student actually saw the ladies mantle back here earlier in June and she was like, wow, that really looks like coral bells. And then she started telling me about this plant. And then while we were in Memphis, Tennessee at the Memphis Botanic Garden, they had these for sale. And so I purchased a few and they made it all the way back from Tennessee to go back here with the ladies mantle. And the leaves are so similar. And I believe the coral bells blooms white and the ladies mantle blooms yellow. So we'll see. Here's a little fig tree that I propagated from a cutting in the spring and it really just took off. I couldn't believe it, it was a miracle. And here, home the Mashivaya, we have the bones, which are an indication to the children that come and work here that when you see bones, you know that you are stepping into an area where there's a poisonous plant. And so there are also some bones over on the altar. A bug just flew into my eye. Over on the altar where the datura is because datura as well as poisonous so that the children and the adults that visit this garden will know, okay, there's something in this area that's poisonous. And so I need to be aware of that. And um, there's no need to fear poisonous plants, but there is a respect and a reverence that we have because uh, when mishandled, then they can really hurt us. So we want to have respect for these plants and really honor and admire their power. 
So here's the belladonna. And if you come in close, you can see what's going on here with the belladonna. And it hasn't kept her from growing, but it may have stunted her growth. This one, this piece of the belladonna was a new little pup that shot up and is really growing well, but you can see the holes where something has been just munching on it. And if we look at the underside of the leaves, so if you guys have any advice on what's going on here and what's eating the belladonna, I've been searching and searching online for how to grow belladonna and what the different pests could be, but I haven't really found anything. And, you know, I don't know how many people out there are actually growing belladonna, but you can see some, here's a flower that's pretty wilted. And I come out here, oh, here's a really beautiful open flower. I love the flowers of belladonna. They're just so beautiful. And if you get in really close, you can even see the little veins that come through the purple. <clears throat> and here we have, you can see where there were flowers that have now gone to berries. So these berries will turn black, like a blackish purple. And within the berries are where the seeds are at. So I've actually been coming out and harvesting a lot of the flowers every day for a particular project that I'm working on. Um, but I love this plant so much. I love her. And there are a few cardinals that are planted here, which really seem to help her grow larger. Um, and I sprayed the belladonna with the neem spray as well, but I'm just really concerned about her health and how to assist her in thriving more. But you can see there's new growth coming after I cut it way back and we'll see what happens with the continued neem spray. Maybe it'll just take some time. I didn't cut off all of the damaged leaves. So a lot of what you're seeing here is old because I just couldn't bring myself to cut all the leaves off. That felt really inappropriate. Um, but again, if you have any advice, leave me some comments below and we'll sort this thing out. All right. Coming back through the trellis, watch your step. <clears throat> Here we have a little aisle of rue. And rue is a witch's herb for protection. So I really feel like every witch should have rue growing in the garden, growing somewhere around the home as a protection herb. Back here, you can see another fig tree. This fig is a couple of years old, but I cut it way back in the fall as well. And so all of that is some new growth. And I won't be cutting our trees back this fall because I don't feel like that's necessary. So I'm excited to see how much growth they'll have next spring. Here is really my pride and joy. These marigolds just really have taken off. I grew these marigolds from seed in our front garden. And then when they started getting really tall, I decided to move them back here because a lot, a lot of the plants that I use for the botanical dyes are back here in the backyard gardens because I'm just so concerned about the deer getting to them. And the deer around here don't really eat the marigolds, but they'll grab them and pull them out of the ground, which is really annoying. So having them in this backyard garden, the deer can't get to them. But marigold, I love the smell. I love the color. It is just a very resilient flower. And I have been planting marigolds all spring and summer. Here, this little guy is a neem tree, and this was gifted to me by a local herbalist last year. And this neem, I thought that it died in the winter, but as you can see, it did not. And I just love the leaves. If you bring your hands along the leaves, it has a really pungent, spicy kind of smell, really similar to the marigolds. So I feel like they complement each other really well and um, really good insect repellent, really good Ayurvedic medicine herb. So that's the little neem tree. More passion vine. The passion vine just volunteers itself all over the yard. And what I found is that instead of digging it up and moving it to where I think it should be, 
which actually doesn't really work well here. The best thing for me to do has been to just let the passion vine grow where it wants to and bring trellises and archways to it to accommodate it. So um, this is kind of a rogue passion vine that's moving through the marigolds and making its way to this back fence. Here we have the main archway. There are multiple passion vines that are growing along this arch. And you can see there, there's another flower. All the flowers are just coming into bloom today. And we don't get, again, a lot of sun back here. So the passion flowers, they kind of bloom slowly, but they bloom all the way through the fall. So um, kind of the sacrifice I've made for having them back here is that we don't get a ton of flowers at once because they just don't get enough sun. This is some sort of squash or gourd. We'll see, some things are just a surprise. Here are some little schizandra vines. And I planted these from seed as another experiment to see if we can get a few um, vines growing with schizandra berries on them after a few years. This I think is a little, it's a different kind of passion vine but it may, it may even be our little local one, but it's awfully cute. More passion vine. Here, oh, I'm glad that we came across one of these guys. These, they look scarier than they are. This is the, I think that you pronounce their name, the Gulf Fritillary caterpillars. And these guys, from my understanding, they only eat passion vine. And so when I see these guys out here, I don't want them to eat all of the passion vine, but if this is the only plant that they eat, this is also the plant they return to as adults. So you see these beautiful orange butterflies. Maybe we'll see some as we're out here, but there are these beautiful orange butterflies that will return to the passion vine and lay their eggs. So when I see these guys, I hate to kill them, but I also don't want them eating all my passion vine because they'll go around and eat a few bites from every leaf, which is really annoying. And so I usually take them and throw them over the fence, <laughs> which might not be the best plan, but I figure that they can work their way back and I'll throw them again, but at least they can live out their life and they can return to this plant as adults. So I'm going to throw this guy over the fence. and now he can make his way back over here if he really wants to work for it, which I think is all he's living for, so he'll be back tomorrow. I've heard of people taking the caterpillars and putting them in containers and feeding them passion leaves and, you know, they do their whole chrysalis and all of that, but I don't really have time for that, so my preferred method is just to toss them and let them work it out. Here we have some bee balm that is going to seed. And the other bee balm in the yard, there's a ton of bee balm this year, but I've already cut it back and scattered the seeds. But this one I missed because it's under this cage. Passion vine is growing all up. If we come down to the base of the passion vine, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on down here, but there are more of those gourds that have started climbing the chairs. This is where I come and sit and have tea or coffee um, and visit with people when they come over. And it's really one of my favorite places to be, to be out here in the garden. If you look down here, you can see where the passion vine is just doing what it wants to do and uh, it's welcome to do so. Over here, okay, so there are, for those of you, we did a medicinal plant walk back here with Ginger Webb last year. And this area was really wild and I was calling it the passion vine nursery and Ginger was like, well, it looks like it's also a mulberry nursery and it is. So there are three mulberry trees back here that just started growing wild that we've let continue to grow. This one's got some yellowing leaves, probably from the intensity of the heat, but this one is the oldest. This one is about three to four years old. Then we have one over here in this passion vine area. This one, actually I cut all of them back in the fall and so all of this is new growth and I won't be cutting them back again. We'll see if we can eventually have some mulberries back here. And then this one is another one. So 
Um, I have these visions of how everything will look over the long term because some of these plants are really, I mean, the trees are really long term things. And so um, kind of sitting and contemplating and imagining how they will look as they get bigger and kind of branch out and shade these different areas. I really like to spend time thinking about that because the garden is a long sight. You know, some things are short sighted, but a lot of the things that happen here will be happening over the next many, many years and things will be changing, which is nice to think about. Here we have motherwort, which I have not grown until now, and it is doing really well. I love the way that the leaves look and the way that they feel. These are really young motherwort plants. Here's a little sunflower baby. And here, I love echinacea because it grows so easily here in the Texas Hill Country. Um, a lot of the echinacea back here was scattered all throughout the yard, and I finally got myself together and gathered all of them and put them into one area and they seem to really be happy with that. Every week or so, I'll come out and harvest the echinacea flowers. And so there are only a few flowers back here, but they are really, really sturdy flowers. I mean, I reckon you could scrub something with that if you really wanted to. Um, but I love the way that the echinacea is more of a white or yellow when it first blooms and then that pink color that we are familiar with comes in later. So with the echinacea, I'll harvest the above ground parts to make into medicine and then in the fall I'll come out and harvest some roots to add to that medicine. So um, the tinctures that I make with the echinacea are of the full plant. Here's some sweet cute little chamomile and the chamomile I really crowded in. I grew all of this from seed in the front gardens and I moved it back here. You can see there's some calendula and some echinacea growing in between. Uh, so this little area is going through a lot of transition as is the whole garden all the time. But the chamomile, I wasn't sure if it wanted to be so snug with itself, but it seems to like that. And so I've just, I haven't really thinned anything out or moved any plants around. Uh, and I come out here and harvest these flowers every few days as well. Here's more bee balm that hasn't quite gone to seed yet. And then there's more chamomile and yarrow. And this yarrow actually was gifted to us last fall. and. I think I said this in the other video that I always thought I couldn't grow yarrow, but it was that I had started it in the wrong season. Instead of starting it in the summer here, uh, I had more success starting it in the fall and letting it go through the winter and then bloom in the spring. All right, so, well, there are a few more plants over here and then I think that we'll probably take a break and maybe do a part two because there are a lot more plants back here but this video is getting pretty long so we want to keep it kind of short. Here are more marigolds, our mulberry. This is a very young peach tree and peach leaf and twig are some of the best medicine for me for the summer because peach is very cooling not only to the physical body but to the emotions uh, and I tend to run very hot and so in the summertime I'm more prone to being irritated and pushed into being angry and peach leaf and twig really help to calm the body uh, cool the body and cool the emotions so both peach and um, Mimosa in particular are the two herbs that really, really assist me through the summer when things get really intense. And over here we have wisteria and I've tried to grow wisteria in the past, but I had two dogs that just completely dug it up and destroyed it. And so this one, I planted probably in the mid spring and it's doing really well. What I really love 
about it is this curly cue that the vine is doing. It reminds me of a pig's tail and I just really <laughs> love the way that looks. Um, but wisteria is another really strong ally for a witch's garden. And so I have wanted to have wisteria out here for a while and I can't wait for it to come into bloom next year to see what that's all about. But the intention is to have it climb this fence and then take off wherever it wants to be in whichever direction. Here's some rogue blackberry. We came and moved all of our blackberry bushes, but this one escaped that transplant. And, and so um, I'll probably cut this one back in the fall. This, our blackberries have thorns and they're really, really intense. Um, but the goats, man, the goats love blackberry leaves. And so when I cut it back, in the fall, I always give them, give the leaves to the goats, um, or they get some of the leaves. They don't get all of them. Let's see. I think that's enough for now. If you look over down yonder this way, you can see there's more plants going on all the way back to that back corner. And then there's a bed here in the center and a vegetable bed, a vegetable bed over there. But that's a lot of time. So we're gonna cut for now and we'll make another video of the rest of the backyard garden. But um, this is really my most favorite place to be. It's where I feel really supported, really comforted. And uh, this garden is my home. And so thank you for joining me here in this garden. And if you like this video, click like, um, subscribe and share this video with those other people that you feel would really enjoy it. And if you have any comments, please leave the comments below. I will read them. I will respond to them. And that's a wrap. Thank you. Namaste.